Over the years there have been many story driven games where the gameplay takes a backseat to the story itself. Some people dislike such games due to them basically being interactive movies or shows where you can occasionally interact with the surroundings. Other people like such games because of how they combine decision making and watching movies. Sometimes these games have different outcomes based on your decisions, so your and my decisions in the game might produce entirely different scenes, dialogues and sometimes endings, while the main few story points, locations or characters are shared. Sometimes the genre pulls a reverse Uno card and we get things like Black Mirror, Bandersnatch or Late Shift, both of which are basically interactive movies or series. Over the years this kind of choose your own adventure games has been getting more popular even though a large amount of quote unquote traditional gamers dislike them. The biggest studio in this kind of games was Telltale Games. They have been famous for their The Walking Dead series, A Wolf Among Us and for kicking all of their employees out in 2018. I like to play devil's advocate for certain games. Today's game is no different because I have a special connection with it, not because of how much I like it but because of how much everyone else seems to dislike it. And I admit this game was a little bit... How do you do fellow kids? Either way, the game is Life is Strange from Don't Not. It was the second game from the mentioned developer, Don't Not, and it's just about 7.5 years old. Originally this game was panned for its relatable writing and cringe inducing lines, and frankly yeah, some cringe lines are there. Now, let's talk business. I got nothing for you. Wrong. You got hella cash. <laughs> You serious? This game focuses on the tale of Max Caulfield, a girl returning to her hometown to attend Black Hole Academy to become a professional photographer. However, a lot has changed since she left and a lot of things will happen in the span of a single week. But before we get into the story, I have to discuss the mechanics of this game so that you can understand what makes it so special. And if you're wondering why the facial animations look like that, it's because I was playing the original version and not the remastered one, which tends to be unruly. The first and the most obvious mechanics are the dialogues. You'll often have dialogues that determine how certain characters will react in future interactions, how certain aspects of the story change, and how some events are going to play out. Choices will have some minor or moderate effect at a certain point when an icon of a butterfly appears in the corner after you make them. The more significant choices in this game are the important choices. You can tell that you've reached them when the game freezes on these choices to give you the time to think your choice through. Usually these choices have a major impact on the story itself and also change your dialogues and sometimes even surroundings in major ways. You wanted a universal remote, that remote controls your universe. The biggest feature of this game is that you can reverse time and go back before making a choice or before a conversation to change its outcome. This encourages exploration of your options while still limiting you enough to not give you total control over the story. Reversing after certain dialogues or events sometimes gives you new options in them, so sometimes you have to pretend like you're a time-traveling MK Ultra operative and surprise certain characters with information that no one besides them and you knows to steer the conversation in an entirely new direction. I use a combination of lies, manipulation, cheating, stealing, gaslighting, bullying, insulting, and flexing to make sure that everybody stays under my thumb where I want them. This feature was directly lifted from Dot Nuts first game, Remember Me, a game where you play as an Everest Nillen in Paris after World War III, trying to figure out why your memories got wiped and who you truly are. A major feature that got really downscaled in the final product was memory remixing, a type of scenes where you enter the memories of a subject to fast forward or reverse certain memories and manipulate them to make the characters believe that their memories played out in an entirely different way. She did it. 
As I've previously mentioned, you will be taking the role of Max Caulfield, an 18 years old girl that is returning to her hometown Arcadia Bay to study at the Blackwell Academy. And because the game is set in a high school environment, it naturally suffers from a great deal of cringe of writing. I mean, I love this game, but for fuck's sake, some lines still made me physically recall from pure unfiltered cringe. Now you're totally stuck in the retro zone. Sad face. Very good, Victoria. <laughs> what up, Max? How are you? Here's your flash. Thanks. Friend, no problem. So. Another reason why this game might have the writing it has is because the writers were unfamiliar with that time's youth and their culture in America. This entire game was originally written by Jean Lucano and converted into a game script by a French team, and only afterwards was it translated into English and fine-tuned by Christian Devine, the man who worked on Deus Ex's story. The game is very slow-paced, and certain sections that seemingly only take a few minutes to play out can take up to 15 or even 20 minutes to complete depending on the player's patience. The first episode is where the player is getting introduced to all the side characters, but it can be a bit tedious even if you like to explore. Don't worry, it's just the opening episode, the game will pick up pace after it is done. Also, just like in my Silent Hill Shattered Memories video, I won't be mentioning all of the variations and consequences of every decision you can make in this game. I'll be showing all of the important choices and how the dialogues after them play out, but I won't show you their outcomes later in the game, as I don't have the access to a petabyte server to record it all, and the eventual outcome would require this to be added as series to some streaming platform. Uh, look, do you want this to be unnecessarily long? Do you want this to be as long as the funny yellow kill video from the British fanboy? Yeah, that's what I thought. So, for the purposes of this video, I'll show you just my playthrough. Spoiler warning here as well, from now on this video will contain spoilers, so if you don't want me to spoil your enjoyment of the game, you can click off now and play the game to experience it for yourself first. And if you haven't played it, I do recommend you to play it. You will now have 5 seconds to do so. And by the way, I'm sorry if the footage sometimes gets choppy, my OBS decided to shit the bed with this game. And to keep this as short as possible, I will cut out the unnecessary cutscenes and include only the ones that I find significant for the story. So let's get into the first episode. Max wakes up in a forest while a giant tornado is tearing up the town of Arcadia Bay. After she arrives to the lighthouse to witness the destruction of the town, the lighthouse gets struck by a flying boat and Max is seemingly killed. She suddenly wakes up in a photography class and realizes that it was just a really realistic dream she had while she had a snooze during the lecture. One of her classmates drops a pen, another one gets a paper ball thrown at her and another one's phone rings. Here you can interact with a few things, most importantly a diary, a camera and a photo, all of which are integral to the story itself and especially the photo. In the business, we call this foreshadowing. In your diary you can get some extra insight on the events happening to Max by reading her journal entries, reading character info and you can also look at pictures you've taken, notes and SMS messages. To reassure herself that she's back in reality, Max takes a selfie with her camera Here, and right in the lecture. I believe Max has taken what you kids call a selfie, a dumb word for a wonderful photographic tradition. And Max has a gift. Of course, as you all know, the photo portrait is Can you please tell us the name of the process that gave birth to the first self-portraits? I did know, but I kind of forgot. You either know this or not, Max. Is there anybody here? Stereotype self-portrait was done by Robert Cornelius. You can find out all about him in your textbook or even online. Hey guys, don't forget the deadline to submit a photo in the Everyday Heroes contest. I'll fly out with the winner to San Francisco where you'll be feted by the art world. It's great exposure and it can kickstart a career in photography. So Stella and Alyssa, get it together. Taylor, don't hide. 
I'm still waiting for your entry too. And yes, Max, I see you pretending not to see me. After you stand up from the desk, you should talk to Kate and be generally positive towards her because she's an integral character to the story. You can also listen to the dialogue the teacher, Mr. Jefferson and Victoria are having at the desk while you stand near them to find out that Victoria is trying to be the teacher's pet while Jefferson is clearly trying to tell her in a polite manner that he's having none of that. You should also examine the paper ball Kate got thrown at her before you leave. While Max is leaving the class, Jefferson stops her from just leaving without submitting her photo for a contest called Everyday Heroes. After a brief conversation, you can leave the class to the hallway. Normally in this cutscene you'd hear a soundtrack, but as I was recording this I realized that this entire game has a copyrighted soundtrack and since I was already walking the line in the last video, I don't want to risk it again. While walking around you can examine the surroundings to learn more about the inner culture of the school. There are also a lot of missing persons posters of someone named Rachel Amber everywhere. Max walks to the toilets to clear her head and decides to tear the photo that she wanted to submit for the Everyday Heroes photo contest. A butterfly flies in and Max decides to take a photo of it. It's cool, Nathan. <laughs> Don't stress. You, you're okay, bro. Just count to three. Don't be scared. You own this school. If I wanted, I could blow it up. <laughs> you're the boss. So what do you want? I hope you check the perimeter, as my step-ass would say. Now, let's talk business. I got nothing for you. Wrong. You got hella cash. That's my family, not me. Oh, boo-hoo, poor little rich kid. I know you've been pumping drugs and shit to kids around here. I bet your respectable family would help me out if I went to them. Man, I can see the headlines now. Leave them out of this bitch! I can tell everybody Nathan Prescott is a punk ass who begs like a little girl and talks to himself. You don't know who the fuck I am or who you're messing around with! Where'd you get that? What are you doing? Come on, put that thing down! Don't ever tell me what to do! I'm so sick of people trying to control me! You are going to get in hella more trouble for this than drugs! Nobody would ever even miss your punk ass, would they? Get that gun away from me, psycho! No! Whoa! What the fuck? Max accidentally rewinds the time and is listening to the exact same lecture. She starts watching her surroundings and notices the exact same events as when she woke up for the first time happen again. Here is where you learn how this ability works and how rewinding time can grant you new dialogue options. Don't forget to talk to Kate again and run to the toilets. Max will be stopped by Jefferson while leaving again and you can rewind to use a quote Jefferson mentions. At least the developers let you skip the conversations you've already been through, so it makes the conversations you have to go through multiple times more bearable. In the toilets after the guy and the girl come in to argue, you can push the car to the side to find a hammer, with which you can break the fire alarm open and press it. The two leave the bathroom after the girl punches the guy in the nuts, but the school is on lockdown. After leaving the bathroom, Max gets harassed by the security guard David Matson, but gets saved by the principal. You can choose to either tell him about Nathan waving the gun around, or act like nothing had happened. This is the first choice that has a major effect on the story later on, so I chose to report him. Leaving the school sends you to the schoolyard, and here you can get to know various not really important side characters. Most of them have no effect on the story except for Miss Grant, as signing her petition will have a medium effect on the story. While walking around, Max gets a message from Warren and has to go to her dorms to pick up the USB she borrowed from him. While entering the dorms, you can talk to various characters here as well. The entrance to girls' dormitories is blocked by Victoria and her two minions, so you have to now figure out how to get them to let you pass through. To get them out of the way, you'll need to watch the janitor Samuel go up the ladder with a bucket of paint to paint the windows. Rewind time, detach his bucket's handle and watch Victoria get the paint splashed on her. Are you kidding? 
Look at this! Jill, Victoria, it's just water. No. Yeah, water on my cashmere. Dude. No way! No fucking you okay, way! okay, Victoria? Oh, Samuel, sorry. Wet, wet paint is not good for hair, nope. Sorry. Get the hell away from me, weirdo. Hold on, hold on. We'll get some towels. We'll be right back. So move your ass before the I The girl crash. in the striped shirt sounds kind of similar to Max, and that's because they have the same voice actress, Hannah Tell. There were only 13 voice actors working on this game, with nearly 50 different characters, with the most characters being done by Don McManus, who voiced 7 different characters. The voice actors did an amazing job with this game, as I didn't realize that some of the characters had the same voice actor behind them only after my second ever playthrough. Yeah, sometimes you can clearly tell that a voice actor had done multiple characters, but it's tolerable. Now you can either comfort or mock Victoria for mocking your selfie. I chose to comfort her as I am not an asshole. Either way, she gets out of the way and you can enter the dormitories. Here you can write on Kate's plate and after arriving to your room, you can learn a bit more about Max and her life. The USB drive is not here as Dana the cheerleader borrowed it from her. When you go to her room to pick it up, you can see her friend Juliet lock her in. Talking to her reveals that Victoria told her that Dana was sexting with her boyfriend Zack and Dana asks you to find the evidence in Victoria's room. Snooping through Victoria's things reveals that she is a stereotypical spoiled rich kid. And by this point, you've probably realized that the characters in this game are very stereotypical overall. The rich bitch and their minions, the rich assholes, family controls the town, the quiet girl, the nerd the cheerleader, the investigative reporter, the broken war veteran, the struggling mom, the punk kid, the skateboarders, the jocks, it's like a compilation of the most stereotypical characters from American high schools. I'm gonna talk a bit about this in the epilogue for this video, so stick around to the end if you wanna hear what I have to say about that. Here you can also talk to Dana about the pregnancy test, and if you play around with time a bit, you can find out that she got pregnant with a football player's child, but had an abortion. So grab the flash drive and go out. Here you can save Alyssa from harm for the first time, something you will be able to do multiple times throughout the game. Going away from the dormitories, a cutscene starts. So don't think I'm blind. I see everything here at Blackwell. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, and leave me alone. Hey, why don't you leave her alone? Excuse us, this is official campus business. Excuse me, you shouldn't be yelling at students or bullying them. Hey, hey, nobody is bullying anybody. I'm doing my job. No, you're not. You're part of the problem, Missy. I will remember this conversation. Oh, Max, that was great. I think you scared him for once. I have to go, but thank you. It means a lot. Anytime, Kate. This is another pretty important choice you have to make. I suggest you take a stand for Kate here, as it will make Max's relationship with Kate better. Taking a photo of the confrontation won't grant you many positives, as you'll be in hot water with David later on anyways, so it doesn't really matter if she catches some heat from him here. Max arrives to the parking lot, and if you read the license plates of the various cars, you will find references to various shows such as Twin Peaks, Quantum Leap, The Sopranos, Gabagool, and others. What up, Max? How are you? Here's your flash. Thanks. No problem. Check out my new wheels. Cool. I need to talk to somebody, just to get it out of my system. Dr. Warren Graham is in the house. I won't even prescribe you any meds. experience in Mr. Jefferson's class today. I mean, life-changing. Have you ever had a dream so real it was like a movie? Max Caulfield, right? You're one of the Jefferson's photo groupies? I'm one of his students. What the fuck ever? I know you like to take pictures, especially when you're hiding out in the bathrooms. You best tell me what you told the principal, now. Answer me, bitch! What are you talking about? I know you're new here, but don't even play stupid with me. I'm not new. I've lived here for years. Then you should know the Prescotts own this shithole. Then you don't have to worry about me. Worry about yourself. Do not analyze me! I pay people for that. Worry about yourself, Max Caulfield. Take a step back, Nathan Prescott. Oh, man. You're telling me what to do? Get away from her, dude! 
Hey, leave him alone! Nobody tells me what to do! Not my parents, not the principal, that. or that whore Wait in the down. bathroom! <gasps> Max? Chloe? No way. You again. Warren! Go! Go! I got this! Get in, Max! Get your punk asses out of there now! Don't even try to run! Nobody! Me. Nobody! It's the girl Max saved from getting shot in the bathroom, Chloe. She was her childhood friend, but Max moved away just after Chloe's dad, William, died. Chloe turned into a snarky punk girl, while Max hasn't changed a bit. Of course, she's kinda mad at Max for not contacting her for 5 years and for not reaching out after returning to Arcadia Bay. Not everything changes, except my camera has officially taken a shit. My step douche has a boatload of tools. Maybe you can fix it at my place. I need very specific tiny tools. Bird alert. My stepdad has a fully stocked garage. And he actually is a tiny tool. Welcome home, Max. Come on in, don't be shy. The house still looks nice. Home shit home. In Chloe's room, she will ask you to put on music and you can find the photo of Rachel Amber, the girl from the missing persons poster. Amber was Chloe's best friend after Max's family moved to Seattle, but she disappeared without a trace. And as you will find out from various conversations throughout the game, Rachel was very popular with literally everyone, be it the outcasts, the skateboard kids or even the rich kids in Vortex Club. Max leaves the room to go find the tools she needs to repair her camera. If you explore the house a bit, you will learn that her mother is swimming in depths, and as if it wasn't enough, David Madsen, the security guard you saw earlier, is her stepdad. He's a war veteran, and you can even find fluoxetine tablets in the bathroom, which is a medication used to manage PTSD. While examining various objects around the house, Max reminisces about her childhood here and about Chloe's parents, Joyce and William. In the garage you can find David's plans for security cameras in the school, which is something Miss Grant mentioned when you were talking to her outside of the school. Also David put up cameras around the house and for some reason he is collecting information about Kate Marsh, stalking her and taking photos of her. After some snooping through the garage, you can get the precision tools Max needs on top of the washing machine by messing with time. After you get them, go back to Chloe's room. You found the tools. Sweet. You can sit at my desk and fix your camera. So? I can't fix this thing. Are these your new photos? Yeah, I just took them today. Let me see. Wait, I've seen this before. Uh, no way. When did you take this? You took this photo, you brat? In the bathroom today. You set off the alarm. That's why Nathan raged after you. It totally makes sense. You hella saved my life. Now tell me the truth, Max. I was there, hiding in the corner. Damn, you are a ninja. A ninja would have cut Nathan's head off. I just took a butterfly photo. That is so badass. Oh yeah, I almost wet myself when I saw the gun. So, did you recognize me? I wasn't sure. I know I look a lot different. I was scared, too. I, I couldn't see straight. I don't blame you, Max. Like you said, it's been that kind of day. So you must have overheard our conversation. Just a bit. There is no way you didn't hear every single vowel. Okay, I only heard something about money, drugs, but that's it. Now for the big question. Did you tell anybody? Like who? Like anybody. Stop stalling, sister. The principal. But he didn't seem to believe me. The principal? Are you still 12? That drunk jackass only cares about cash for Blackwell Academy. Don't trust him. I didn't mention you at all. Swear. Thank God. I'll tell you more someday. And I seriously owe you, Max. 
I, uh, know it was your birthday last month. This was my real father's camera. I want you to have it. That's so cool you remembered my birthday, but I can't take this. Of course you can. My dad would be pissed if I never used it, and now I know it'll be used awesomely. And I'll snag this picture as a symbol of our reunion. Cool? Yes, of course it's cool. Thank you. This camera is so sweet. Now that we got that mushy shit out of the way, I feel like stage diving. Let's thrash this place. This song fucking rules. Can't dance, hippie? Come on. Rock out, girl. Yes, break it down, Max. Yo, turn it off, turn it off. How many times have I told you to stop blasting that punk shit? Dude, the music's not even on. Asshole. I'm coming up, we need to talk. Oh, no fucking way. You need to hide now. My stepdad will kill me if he finds you here. Chloe, what's going on? Open this door, please. Chill, I'm changing, is that okay? Max, find a place to hide, now! Now you can either hide in the wardrobe or stay out in the open. If you stay out in the open, David won't be happy, and if you've interrupted his argument with Kate earlier, he will be even more pissed off. Then he finds the wheat and Chloe will try to blame it on you. You can either take the blame or blame it on Chloe, but in either of these choices is good, so I suggest you move over the lamp and stay in the wardrobe. You can step out during the argument to take the blame for the weed, but I suggest you stay inside. David then hits Chloe and walks out. Max and Chloe leave and Max realizes that they are at the lighthouse from her nightmare. Either way, this is the last conversation of the episode, so go ahead and talk to Chloe. Sure you don't want to be alone? Sit down if you want. I'm sorry I wussed out. No worries. I know my step-dork can be scary. I'm not as brave as you. And David is in Has he always been this way? Ever since my desperate mom dragged his ass to our home, I never trusted David. He freaked out on poor Kate Marsh today. I know her. She's cool. Only that prick would bully her. He has some kind of weird agenda. He has a lot of secret files. Rambo still thinks he's gathering enemy intelligence. Did you take a peek? Well, yeah. I couldn't help it. Never change. What did you find? Creepy photos of Kate Marsh. Other Blackwell students. Chloe, your house is under surveillance. What are you talking about? There are cameras all over the house. I saw it on a monitor in the garage. I knew it! He's so hella fucking paranoid! I'll keep this a secret for now. Sometimes ignorance is bliss. No wonder I'm so miserable. Everybody in this town knows everybody's secrets. Even yours? Not anymore. So what do you have on Nathan? He's an elite asshole who sells bad shit cut with laxative. He was too rich for the place and too wasted and he kept flashing bills. Just tell me what happened, Chloe. Now. I was an idiot. I thought he was so blazed it would be an easy score. You needed money that bad? Actually, yes. I owe big time. And I thought I'd have enough for me and Rachel if she showed up. He dosed my drink with some shit. I woke up and that perv was smiling, crawling towards me with a camera. Go on. Everything was a blur. I tried to kick him in the balls and broke a lamp. Nathan freaked, so I managed to bum rush the door and get the hell out. I figured I would make him pay me to keep quiet. So we met in the bathroom. And he brought a gun. That was Nathan's last mistake. He's still dangerous, Chloe. Not just to you. Oh, good thing you notified the principal. I feel safer already. I won't always be there to save you. You were here today, Max. You saved me. I'm still tripping on that. Seeing you after all these years feels like... Destiny. If this is destiny, I hope we can find Rachel. I miss her, Max. This shit pit has taken away everyone I've ever loved. I'd like to drop a bomb on Arcadia Bay and turn it to fucking glass. Oh no! Not again! October 11th? Is this 
Friday? That's only four days away. Chloe, you're here. I'm back. Oh my lord, this is real, it's real. Oh man, this sucks. Max, what's going on? You totally blacked out. I didn't black out. I had another vision. The town is going to get wiped out by a tornado. Oregon gets about five tornadoes every 20 years. You just zoned. No, no, I saw it. I could actually feel the electricity in the air. Come on, take a breath, okay? Chloe, I'm not crazy. But there's something else I have to tell you. Something hardcore. Talk to me, Max. I had the same vision earlier in class. When I came out of it, I discovered I could reverse time. Like I said, not crazy. But hi, right? Listen to me, how do you think I saved you in the bathroom? By reversing time? Yeah, sure. I saw you get shot, Chloe. Saw you actually die. I was able to go back and hit the fire alarm. Okay, I see you're a geek now with a great imagination, but this isn't anime or a video game. People don't have those powers, Max. I don't know what I have, but I have it. And I'm scared shitless. You need to get high. It's been a hell insane fucking day. <gasps> what the hell is this? Snowflakes? It's like 80 degrees. How? Climate change. Or a storm is coming. Max, start from the beginning. Tell me everything. Max tells Chloe about her powers and an outro sequence begins. A few characters are shown to you, as well as an ominous shot of a shelf with red files with various names written on them. After the credits, you will be shown a neat screen that shows you all of your different choices you've made in the episode and also how many players chose each of them. Sometimes in the secondary screen, you can clearly tell which choices you and other players completely missed. And with that, the setup episode is over and the second episode begins. If you look at the town in the background of the menu, you will see that it has changed ever so slightly. While the last one was sunny and had that wonderful golden hour feel to it, this one makes you feel like the game is taking place in England with its cloudy sky. Birmingham is a fucking shithole! I hate the fucking place! I fucking hate it! After you click on continue, you will get a small recap of the first episode, just in case you have Alzheimer's disease. This was necessary at the time because the episodes were released a few months apart, starting in January 2015 with the first episode and ending on the fifth episode in October 2015. So Max wakes up in her dorm room. Look through the computer to see Warren be a sim for Max through email. Sim! 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 But seriously, why the fuck did they think that we were communicating with email 10 fucking years ago? I mean, this game is set in 2013 and we already had Android phones and Messenger. You can look through the clutter around the room, but you should get Max into a shower, so you know the place that anime fans and Asmund Gold refuse to visit. I hadn't showered in a month. Get the bathroom back from the wardrobe, and is it just me or was Victoria voiced by Kate's voice actress here? Do not forget I need those papers before tonight. Like now. Thanks, Sherry. If you go a bit down the hallway, you'll see Brooke and Juliet watching a video on a phone outside of Dana's room. I didn't Whatever think they're watching like must this. be hot stuff. Knocking on those bros. Ew. We shouldn't be watching this. Everybody's seen it by now. Kate is already in the showers and will thank you for standing up for her last day. She will ask Max to give her back the book The October Country by Ray Bradbury, which is an actual book by a real author who also wrote the book Fahrenheit 451. Finally entering the shower, Max witnesses Victoria and her two minions harassing Kate over a porn video. After you leave the shower, you are able to erase the video link from the mirror. Yes, I know it might seem futile because everyone already knows about it, but it will be beneficial later on in the episode. It is now clear why Kate is getting bullied. She 
appeared in a porn video even though she is a Christian, but we don't know why she did it yet. When Max returns to her room, you will discover that Nathan has drawn a threatening message onto the wall if you've snitched on him to Principal Wells in the first episode. The book is under a paper to the right of the sofa and because we have to have a scene where the hero conveniently abuses her superpowers, we have to reverse time to fix the drink spill on the book. After getting dressed and approaching Kate's room, you'll also get a threatening SMS message from Nathan. Keep your smart mouth shut about everything or I'm coming for your ass. I know where you sleep. If you snoop through Kate's things, you'll find out that she is extremely depressed because of all the bullying. Her family had already found out about the video and the only person who had shown support to her so far was her dad. While talking to her, she will be thankful for Max's intervention with David, who seems to be stalking her because he thinks that she is a member of the Vortex Club. Again, be nice to her during this conversation and try to be empathetic to have a good standing with Kate. She will tell you that she went to a single Vortex Club party where she got drugged and doesn't even remember recording the video. Nathan Prescott offered to take her to a hospital, but instead took her to some weird place where Nathan and someone else speaking in a soft voice was. She then got injected with something and woke up in the dorms the next day. Kate thinks that the video was made and uploaded by Victoria, who was present at the party where Kate was drugged. Kate also asks you for advice on what to do next and to make it easier for yourself to deal with Kate later on, you should tell her to go to the police. If you tell her to gather more evidence, you will just make things harder for yourself later on and hurt her feelings in the process. So all that is left for you here is to leave the dormitories. Outside you will find Taylor, one of Victoria's minions, sitting near a tree. By talking to her and rewinding time you can befriend her and find out that her mom had a back surgery and only Victoria was there for her during that difficult time. So it doesn't seem like Victoria should be that much of a bitch after all. On your way out, Nathan's father Sean will text you if you snitched on his son and won't be very pleased with what she did. A few steps ahead of you is also Warren, your obvious romantic interest and you can agree to go on a date with him. He doesn't say it is a date but come on, we all know that Warren is simping for Max and that Brooke is simping for Warren and hates Max because of it and now it's a sort of a twilight type of love triangle so uh, let's just move on. Walking through the campus, Max notices David and Nathan talking to each other. She takes the bus to two whales, the diner where Chloe's mom, Joyce, works. Outside of it, you can talk to a couple of people, like the fisherman and the homeless woman behind the diner. Inside the diner, you can talk to a couple of people as well, and talking to the police officer will give you a bunch of details on Chloe's family situation. After sitting down in your spot, Joyce comes around to catch up with you, give you an insight on Chloe's and David's relationship and breakfast. Chloe then arrives to the diner and is just as snarky and pissed off as always. After sitting down, she tests Max's superpowers by making her guess what's in her pockets. After you get this right, you will have to remember everything happening in the diner in the next few moments to predict the future. Get everything correct and while the two are leaving the diner, Max is phone rings. Answer it to get some bonus points with Kate in exchange for Chloe getting berated by Joyce or you can ignore it and help Chloe escape from her mom's lecture while ignoring Kate's call. While they are leaving the diner, Max and Chloe are being watched by someone ominously staring at them from the parking lot. In the junkyard, Chloe will pull out her gun again and ask you to bring a few bottles to shoot. Explore the junkyard to find the bottles, a ghost of a doe, as well as Chloe and Rachel's secret hangout spot. Bring the bottles to Chloe and use your rewind power to help Chloe shoot the bottles. I forgot to record this, but you can make Chloe accidentally shoot herself here as well. After the car crashes down on the bottles, Max will pass out again to have another tornado vision. Just as Max is gathering herself, Chloe dares her to shoot the revolver, but Frank, a drug dealer, comes around. Hey, it's Thelma and Louise. Or is it Bonnie and Clyde? Excuse us, Frank. Oh, sorry, Chloe. Don't let me get in the way of your bonding. I heard the gunshots and the breaking glass. It's cute that you're playing with guns. Just like me at your age. We're not anything alike, man. We both need money. In fact, you need it so bad, you owe me a shitload, don't you, Chloe? Huh? You'll get your money. Don't they all say that? 
You know, even when they're broke and acting tough. What are you hiding there, girly? Let me see. Where did you get that bracelet? A friend, and it's none of your goddamn business. You're my business now, That's and I... That's Rachel's bracelet. Why the fuck are you wearing her bracelet? Calm yourself, all right? It was a gift. No, it wasn't. You stole that shit. Give it to me right now, asshole. You better step back before you regret it, girl. I mean it. You want me to cut you, bitch? Please. Please, step back. You're kidding. Put that down. You can either shoot him or you can do nothing. The better option here is to not shoot him and to let him take the gun, which pisses off Chloe. Shooting him will let Chloe keep the gun and will make her happy, but it won't be very beneficial down the line in another confrontation with Frank in the fourth episode. The duo goes on a walk on the railways and we'll talk about Frank and Rachel. Chloe was friends with him, but borrowed money from him. Also, it seems like Rachel was somehow involved with him since he has her bracelet. While Max is taking her photos, she has another vision and Chloe gets stuck in the train tracks. There are two ways to save her. You either break into the nearby hut and cut the wire in the electrical box or you push the giant cable drum off after using the crowbar to unblock the stopper. Whichever way you choose, you manage to save Chloe just in time before she gets killed by the train. She drives Max back to the school just as it starts to rain and theorizes that her powers might be connected to the supernatural events happening around the town lately and maybe even the tornado vision. Back in the school you can notice that everyone is starting to prepare for the end of the world party. Of course you can talk to a couple of people around the school. If you talk to the principal, you'll find out that after you accuse Nathan, he's not exactly friendly as he might be in the pockets of Prescott's. You can talk to Courtney at the table and if you play your cards right, you can befriend her which will also be beneficial in the future. David is also here but talking to him doesn't have much benefits besides him revealing why he wants cameras all over Blackwell. At the end of the hallway, you can notice Kate arguing with Jefferson and running away. If you talk to him, both of them show concerns about Kate. However, he mentions one weird thing. I just don't want Kate Marsh to become the next Rachel Amber. Rachel Amber? What does she have to do with Kate? With all her missing persons posters around, it's hard not to think of her. I miss Rachel too. But think about yourself, Max. The conversation gets interrupted by Jefferson's phone ringing. If you stick around for long enough, you can overhear him talk to someone on the phone in a weird way. Sure, okay. Listen, I do have a class I have to teach. I have to go. Okay, I'll do that. Because I can't have this conversation with you right now, okay? Will you please just hang up the phone? And the business. We call this foreshadowing. If you want to further your romance with Warren, you need to help him in the lab. When Max tries to go to her desk, Nathan and Victoria will be sitting on it, making fun of Max. Better be quiet, Victoria. We have a master snitch and liar here. Did you think we were best friends forever or something? Not at all, Victoria. Max is such an attention whore. You would know. Can I sit down now? Oh, please do. Take a selfie of this moment. Yeah, Max, so I won't forget you. Assholes. What up, Max? Hey, Warren. I saw Kate earlier and her eyes were puffy from crying. Kate has a lot on her this plate. class, beat it. Everybody else, please sit Maybe down. We have a lot to cover today and so little time as usual. I see all the usual suspects here. Anybody seen Kate Marsh? I think everybody has seen Kate Marsh by now. <laughs> She's not feeling good. Sounds I guess like Kate in this class now. Viral. I'm worried about because her. Because of their contrasts. Although we don't technically see in Monica. Yo! Some crazy shit is going down at the girl's dorm! Zachary, do not come into my class like that ever again. Listen, everybody remain seated. Dismissed. Is this for real? It's flipped 
It's Caden. She is about to commit suicide by jumping off the roof. Max tries to reverse time until she finally gets the time to stop while trying to get up on the roof. This is why I told you that you should be nice to Kate. This is her suicide attempt and if you've paid enough attention to her through the first two episodes and been nice to her, you can actually increase your chances of talking her down from the edge. You will get two options per prompt, either of which will work if you've been friendly with her. However, if you weren't friendly towards Kate, there will always be only one option that will work when you try to talk her down mixed in with the other options that will make the situation worse. If you fail the conversation, you will see Kate jump, but if you don't, Max will take Kate's hand and help her calm down. Afterwards, Max, Nathan, Jefferson and David will be in the principal's office and there are a few ways this scene can play out and end which is affected by your previous choices and your final choice. You can accuse one of the three other people in the room of causing Kate's suicide attempt, either Nathan for drugging her, David for bullying her or Jefferson for making her cry. Choose one depending on your views for each character and you will get your outcome depending on your current standing with the principal. In my playthrough I chose to accuse Nathan of drugging her, which in turn gets him suspended and starts the outro cutscene. All I know is that Kate was at a party and Nathan dosed her. She got wasted and kissed some boys on a viral video without a clue. I dosed her? <laughs> without a clue. Have you seen the video? Whatever. Kate was loaded and You're a liar. The field. You told Kate you took her to the emergency room. I said I was going to take her to the ER. She sobered up eventually. Bullshit. Something happened to her and you know it. How about we talk about you waving a gun in the girl's hey, bathroom? Hey, that's total slander. I could sue you and this school so fast. I already have a personal lawyer. Careful, Mr. Prescott. I have been told of this alleged gun incident, and I have to admit that the video in question was sent to me by multiple sources. Including me. And since Mr. Prescott does appear prominently in the video and was responsible for the party, I have no choice but to suspend him until further notice. Whatever. See you in court. Excuse me. I think Max and Nathan need a break before we grill them further. A friend and student just tried to kill herself. They don't need this forum right now. Yes, I'm kind of devastated right now. I'd like to be with my family. All right, Miss Caulfield, please sign here to confirm what you've told us. I'll continue this investigation from there. Well, I think we know less now than when we started. We'll be assisting the police with further inquiries. I couldn't even believe it was happening. It was literally slow motion as I grabbed her hand. And then I could feel her grabbing mine. Max, that was the greatest thing I've ever seen, ever. You reached out, she reached out, hugs, tears, applause, like a superhero. Not quite, look at me. I'm a mess. Warren, I don't mean to sound weird, but there's something ominous going on at Blackwell. Today proves that. And I'm working on proof that Kate Marsh is connected to Rachel Amber. Somehow. Along with Nathan and Mr. Madsen. Now, I'm not a big conspiracy guy, but I wouldn't doubt it. Nathan did scare me yesterday, and Madsen is a straight-up dickhead. So, what do you think is really happening? What the hell is this? The weather confirms this weird day. I feel that chill. Max, there was no eclipse scheduled today. I would know. I would. I believe you, Warren. I believe anything this week.
Max wakes up at her table when Chloe sends her a message asking to meet her in front of the school. If you look through the notebook, you will find out that the media already knows about Kate's incident from that day and Max is starting to get dragged into the situation as well. You can feed Kate's bunny that's in your room, talk to Taylor in the bathroom and Dana in her room for more world building. You can also go and dig around Victoria's room to find out that she feels quite remorseful about her involvement in Kate's suicide attempt. Outside of boys' dormitories, it's shit-faced Principal Wells who will prevent you from leaving when you try to go past him. To get through him, you need to rewind time far enough to the moment where he is still fiddling with the lock with his back turned against you. When you do this, you will finally meet Chloe. After a short conversation about Kate, Max Powers and finding Rachel, the two spot Victoria flirting with uncomfortable Jefferson outside of the school. Inside the school, Max and Chloe try to break into the principal's office using David's keys, but it turns out that none of those fit into the lock. Look around the room and eventually you will run out of things to interact with. Max will call up Warren, who will in turn send her a step-by-step -step guide on how to build a pipe bomb. You won't have that much trouble finding the ingredients as they are in really obvious spots. Go back to Chloe and blow up the lock, which will trigger an alarm. Enter the office, go back in time before the moment you blow up the door and open it from the other side. In your office you will have to find some documents, so go through everything, read up on all the characters and go to Chloe once you collect what you need. Max, you better come check out these files. Nathan accuses Rachel of bringing drugs on campus and my step troll went along because he thinks Rachel was a bad influence on me. Assholes. If David is teaming up with Nathan Prescott, that's a bad sign. Nathan Prescott the third. Look, it reads like a rap sheet. Bad grades, teacher complaints, secret probation. But I was expelled? At least Nathan was finally suspended. Check out that note. Open it. It's just some crazy drawing. It's not a drawing. Look. Rachel in the dark room. Rachel in the dark room. Over and over. That's it. That's fucked up. What does this even mean? Nathan is truly psychotic. I know he has something to do with Rachel missing. Whoa, listen to this. David M. always asks what's going on in my head. David M. always helps me follow those he follows. <sighs> it's pretty cryptic. No, it sounds like they formed some sort of weird team, the Super Hebros. Jesus. David was stalking Kate, hassling me, and now we know he was all over Rachel, too. Oh, we are so going into his garage files. Plus, I'm getting a little paranoid in here. We got our info. Let's bail. We should definitely get out of here. We pressed our luck enough. Hello, what have we here? Holy shit! Jackpot! Cha-ching! Wow, sir. That's a lot for the handicapped fund. Dude, there's $5,000 here. I could pay Frank back tonight. This'll chill him out after our knife showdown yesterday. Are you gonna make a big issue out of this? Or just rewind and take the greenbacks for yourself? I hope you do that instead of lecturing me. Here you can choose whether you want to leave the money where they are, or if you will allow Chloe to steal them. On one side you might feel like a shithead for stealing the money from the handicapped fund, but on the other side Wells is probably corrupt and this might just be bribe money from Prescott that will go into his pockets instead. There is a clear choice here and even though you might feel like a shithead, you should absolutely steal the money. I think I'm about to steal! Leaving it will only have a negative effect with Frank in a major confrontation in 4th episode, but stealing it will only negatively impact the dorms, as it will prevent the dorm rooms from having an entry for disabled people. Yeah, you might feel like a shithead afterwards, but besides that there is no other major downside. Afterwards, Chloe persuades Max to go for a swim in the school's indoor pools. It doesn't really matter if you choose to go to girls or boys locker rooms, and you can prank Chloe by entering one and then reviving time to come out from behind her. Go and join Chloe in the pool and the two will have a nice girl talk. Why look, an otter in my water. Dun 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 dun. I wish Rachel was here. She would totally love being in here at night. Wish you guys had met each other. We will. With all this stuff going on, I'm starting to think everything is related, and I want to find out for Kate's sake. She almost died today. Your power is changing everything, Max. 
Especially you. I can already Maybe tell. Maybe I'm just stumbling back and forth in time. For what reason? You didn't stumble when you saved me, Max. Thank God. But what if I had? What if Kate didn't jump, but you would be dead? So it's time to start moving forward in time. And we're obviously connected. Stop being so goddamn humble. You're like the smartest, most talented person I've ever known. More than Rachel Amber? Dude, I'm not her groupie, okay? And I'm sure you have Blackwell bros all over you. Like Warren. Warren is nice. <laughs> nice? Ouch. That means friend zone. No, he's really cool. It was so sweet when he stood up to Nathan. But I haven't told him about my rewind power. No worries. Once you get over yourself, you're gonna make the world bow. As long as you're there with me. Don't look so sad. I'm never leaving you. I, uh, think I've had my pool experience for the year. Let's jet. Let's call it a draw. I'm gonna freeze my ass off when I get out. I feel like we just went swimming in Chlorine Bay. You look cute with your hair soaked in chemicals. Thanks. You would know. Max now has to hide. The most reliable place to hide is in the toilet stall in the back as using your rewind power to dodge the security guards might prove to be a bit tedious. If you do everything right you will be able to escape unspotted and Max will sleep at Chloe's place for the night. After waking up the duo will have a chat about Chloe's life in Arcadia Bay and you can look through her stuff to get some more background on Max's relationship with Chloe. Chloe will force Max to get dressed in Rachel's clothes and challenge her for a kiss. If you are a fucking fucking gamer you should choose the kiss option as Chloe will then joke about Warren watching them do interesting things together. and tell him he doesn't stand a chance. Unless he's in the girl and girl action. The, co the, the cook chair! However, if you are shipping Max with Warren, you should refuse the kiss, to which Chloe will joke about Max being all over Warren. Leave the room and if you've managed to save Kate, you will get a text from her here. You can talk to Joyce in the kitchen and she will talk a bit about Rachel, about her concerns for Chloe, and she will show Max her family photos, giving one of them to Max. Chloe will start an argument with Joyce so that you can go and sneak through David's things. The goal here is to find a password for David's computer to look for some evidence. You can search through his things to get a couple of suggestions for the passwords, but because this is in the guide by the summary, I won't tell you where to find the password. <laughs> After you gather the info from David's laptop, which includes indications to Rachel and Frank being more than just a customer and a dealer, go and talk to Chloe, which will start another cutscene. Nice breakfast. David, you, you back already? I have to take a nap after writing up vandalism reports last night. What happened? Some little shit-ass punks broke into the swimming pool. This is what happens at these PC bullshit colleges. Entitled students taking over the campus. Do you know for sure it was Blackwell students? Who else would do it? And I'm gonna bust them. Figures you'd be here. Is that your Rachel Amber Halloween costume? You know more about her than me. No, you and Chloe think you know more than anybody, like all teenagers. Leave Max alone, David. Stop threatening students. He threatens them with surveillance cameras so he can spy on everybody, like he spies on all of us here. Don't start, Chloe. Not now. Yeah, I'm just always starting shit, right? You're a total paranoid, David. Not. Now, Chloe. You used to call me a loser for getting kicked out of Blackwell. So who's the loser now, David? Who haven't you accused or harassed? Between your investigations into Rachel and Kate, what have you done besides getting trouble? Here we can choose to either side with David or Chloe. Siding or not siding with David will have a major impact on Max's relationship with Chloe and it will also impact Joyce. This choice entirely depends on your current view of David and whether he decides to have Max on his side or not. I chose to stand up for Chloe even though I know how this story plays out because nothing really excuses his behavior and he had plenty of opportunities to realize that. Max and Chloe then go to investigate Frank's RV. He's into Wales but they can't get inside the RV because it's locked. 
Max needs to get keys from him, but he won't give them up easily. Outside, you can talk to a couple of people again, including the homeless woman. Frank is inside the dinner, eating his brain. There is also Nathan, but he doesn't really serve much purpose besides showing the player what kind of opinions Nathan currently has on Max. No matter what you choose at first, you won't even see them in his hands. To get the keys, you need to talk to the police officer about Frank and Rachel, and the officer mentions how Frank saved some dogs from a dog fighting club. Go talk to Frank again, mention the dogs and snatch the keys from the table when he's done talking. He will be forced to rewind after he jumps at Max, but doing so will give you Frank's keys without the need to even talk to him. Go to the RV and Cole will give Max a bone to distract Frank's dog with. You can choose to either throw it towards the road or the parking lot. Throwing it towards one of these spots will impact the confrontation with Frank you'll have in 4th episode, but I'm not gonna get into why or how this affects in. Either way, I'm not a fucking monster, so I threw it to the parking lot. Inside of Frank's RV, you can go through his mess to find the gun he took from Chloe. I forgot that he has the gun, so I didn't even look for it and I didn't record it. Sorry. You can find his accounting book by using the knife from the pizza box to open a loose vent next to his bed. In the accounting book, you can find a love letter and a couple of photos which prove that Frank and Rachel were in a romantic relationship and basically were a couple. To progress further, you need to show this to Chloe. That makes me ill that Rachel posed like this for Frank. I wrote him love letters. I can't believe she was banging Frank. Rachel straight up lied to my face. Why didn't she say anything? Because she knew how you would react. And she wasn't much of a friend, huh? Just another person who shits all over me. Why does everybody in my life let me down? My dad gets killed, you bail on me for years, my mother gloms on a stepfucker, now Rachel betrays me. Chloe, Rachel is missing. Nobody betrayed you. Bullshit! Who hasn't? Fuck everybody! Chloe! You can't keep blaming me and everybody for everything wrong in your life. It's so not fair. I gotta blame somebody, otherwise it's all my fault. Fuck that. So now it's Rachel's fault too? Jesus, she was banging that pig, Frank! Bitch lied to my face, Max! I can't trust anybody again. Everybody pretends to care until they don't. Even you. Chloe Price, you better take that back. Right now. Okay, fine. But you just don't understand. It's like I'm being punished by the universe. So who do you most want to blame? My fucking dad, of course. Hello? You blame William? Really? Yes, I do. Damn right. He chose to go out that door and leave me forever. Chloe, your dad didn't choose to leave you. I know that, Max. My mom actually blames herself. Just because she wanted a ride home from work. Sometimes, even I blame her. No, you don't. Yes, Max, I do. Do you know what it's like to wait for your father to come home when you're a kid? And he never does? No. Of course not. But I was with you that day. It was just a terrible accident. I wish that made me feel better. But ever since he died, my life has been dipped in shit. You don't want to hear this, but you're still here. Alive. With me. And that is no accident. You're right. I don't want to hear this. Chloe, I can't do this out on my own. I need you with me. And Rachel needs you. So Chloe is pissed off, Rachel lied to her and now she hates both Max and William. Max takes out the photo Joyce gave her that day, the one William had taken on the last day he was alive. As she's staring at it, Max starts hearing voices and after you focus on the photo, Max goes back in time to that moment, deciding to save William instead of letting him die. You can achieve this by letting him find his keys first, going back in time, taking them and throwing them out of the window as William will find them if you hide them somewhere else or even if Max keeps them in her pocket. Forgot all about you little buddy. Release the keys. Of course. Last time I ordered from Spy Guy Electronics. You can take the bus, right? The stop is right down the street. This I can do. Good call, Max. Sold me already. I'm off to yonder bus stop. Uh, Joyce will love this. 
Max, you are being so fucking strange. You feel okay? Chloe, I am awesome. We are awesome. <sighs> Do you want to go hit the girls' potty and smoke them peace pipe? I think Max is high. She's acting like so weird. You cool, Max? Nobody listened when I said we shouldn't let her in the vortex. Courtney, you don't want anybody in the club. Like whatever, bitch. Warren, he hooked up with Stella? Oh no, this is totally fucked up. What else have I changed? Max Caulfield, taking a break after taking Seattle by storm, huh? We thought we'd never see you again after you left for the big city. No, I'd never do that to Chloe. Speaking of, I know she's been dying to see you. Hold on. Chloe, you have a visitor. It's weird hanging out with you again. I know. I'm glad we are, though. It was nice that you sent me actual words. Because William is alive, everything played out differently. So, for her birthday, William gave a car to Chloe. However, she got into an accident and now is paralyzed below her neck, barely being able to turn her head. By just seeming William, Max had created an infinitely worse reality where she is a spoiled piece of shit and where Chloe and her parents are suffering daily. If you look around the room, you can find out a bit about Chloe from this reality, about what she likes and about what she does in her mostly free time. She is still just as sarcastic as she was in the first reality, but a lot of her humor is just self-deprecating. Have you ever thought about doing a podcast or something? I wish I could punch your face right now. A podcast? Dude, I am a pod in a cast. Boring. Chloe asks Max to put on Blade Runner and they fall asleep while watching it. After Max wakes up, Chloe's headache starts getting worse and she asks Max to bring her the morphine back from upstairs bathroom. While fetching it, you can look around the house and inspect various objects to find out more about how the family is doing. They seem to be neck deep in debts while trying to make Chloe's life as best as it can be, buying her expensive equipment to make her miserable condition at least a bit more bearable. Talking to William shows that he is a way more sarcastic guy than expected, but still just as cheery as Max remembers him. Joyce is upstairs in their bedroom and through dialogues with her we find out that she works two jobs, one in two whales and one is a part-timer for Prescott's at their company Pan Estates that buys out everything in Arcadia Bay. She also reveals that Chloe's respiratory system is failing as a result of her being paralyzed, implying that she may be dying. When you think you've explored this reality enough, go to the bathroom, pick up the morphine bag, and go back down to Chloe's room. That must room. be her mighty morphine machine. No more bongs for her. Uh, give me the blue pill. Of course, my pain just keeps getting worse. But you caught me on a good day. 
Max, I'm so grateful that I'm even able to hang out with you. See, I'm getting mushy. I'm already high. <laughs> You're so adorable. Do you want anything else? Um, stop me if I'm being too emo, but can you grab one of the photo albums over there? I'd like to check out some old pictures of us when we were kids. Please, my diary is like emo ground zero. Is that okay? Perfect. Oh my God. Look how little we are there. We look like toys. I remember that day by the lighthouse. Listen, my Max. My respiratory system is failing, and... Uh, and it's only getting worse. I've heard the doctors talking about it when they thought I was zonked out. So, I know I'm just putting off the inevitable while my parents suffer along, and I will too. This isn't how I want things to end. What? What are you saying? I'm saying that being with you again has been so special. I just wanted to feel like when we were kids running around Arcadia Bay and everything was possible, and you made me feel that way today. I want this time with you to be my last memory. Do you understand? Yes, I do. All you have to do is crank up the IV to 11. Chloe, I, I really don't know if I can do this. I had another friend who wa wanted to end it all, and I did everything I could to try and save her life. How can I be responsible for ending yours? I mean, there's gotta be another way. Max, you were there for your friend, no matter what. Now I'm asking you to help me the same way. I want to help you, Chloe, but I, th I think my help is hurting. At least you have a choice. When you want to make a decision, you can just do it. Look at me. I'm at the mercy of everybody. For once, I want to make my own choice. The most important one of my life. Please, help me, Max. Refusing Chloe's request makes her angry at Max for not ending her suffering, while accepting her request allows Chloe to die peacefully. In my opinion, it's better to let Chloe die here. It doesn't matter whether she gets the lethal dose or not, she would die due to her respiratory system failing in this reality anyways. Realizing this, Max decides to go back and allows William to die in exchange for saving Chloe and making Joyce's life way less miserable. After a return to the main reality, Max finds out that she and Chloe had reconciled and are running a full-scale investigation into Nathan. Welcome to the part of the game that is basically a playable CSI episode. Yeah! What a switch in tone, huh? While going to the garage, Max meets David staring at the photos in the hallway just as he is about to leave the house. Joyce had finally kicked him out and it seems like he really regrets everything, but from the letter to Joyce that you can find in the garage, it seems like there was a reason to why he behaved like a totalitarian asshole that he doesn't mention. Yet. The way you can get to David's files in the locker differs based on whose side you took when confronting David in the previous episode, but either way, you end up with his files. After this, Max and Chloe will either go directly to the dormitories or you will get a scene that appears only in the case you've saved Kate from jumping off the roof at the end of the second episode. Max goes to visit her in the hospital and they have a heart-to-heart -heart moment, during which Kate offers her help with finding Nathan's room. It isn't necessary to say save Kate in order to find the room, as finding it is pretty easy by itself. Max and Chloe go to the dormitories, where they meet Jefferson and Chloe tries to riz him up. You better answer that so best once. Of course, you can chat up people here as well, but to progress further, you have to go talk to Chloe, after which the two go to investigate Nathan's room in men's dormitories. By the way, if you are trying to get Max and Warren together, you should write a message on his small whiteboard he has outside of his room. If you saved 
communicate, she will send you a message with Nathan's room number. Go there and after you break in, you have to search through his stuff. Doing so reveals that Nathan is mentally disturbed, addicted to prescription drugs and that his family situation is not ideal as his sister had basically ran away to escape their dad. After you've investigated enough things around the room, Max notices some marks on the floor which allows you to move the couch and get Nathan's secret phone. While Max and Chloe are leaving, Nathan comes in and tries to attack them. Warren comes to help by beating up Nathan and here you can choose to either stay out of it or you can stop Warren. Staying out of it is arguably the worst choice as you will find out in a little while. But besides Chloe getting Nathan's gun, you will also get the pleasure of watching Nathan get his shit kicked in and crying on the ground in a fetal position. Stopping Warren doesn't give you the gun but it can allow an upcoming interaction with Frank to turn out way better. Damn, that was intense. Warren, uh, th thank you so much. For what? For headbutting Nathan Prescott. That was awesome. I don't know. I almost went crazy there. Or should I call the cops on Nathan? No police. Not yet. Uh, so maybe you better... Um... Warren, me and Max have to do this on our own. No offense. It's cool. Whatever I can do to help. What you can do is find out anything you can about Nathan's father. Man, that guy is so fucking in love with you. I know. He really did give a serious beat down to Nathan. It was a little scary to watch him do that. Now let's make a date with Frank. Will he even answer you? Frank always answers when he wants money. Like I said, Frank wants to see me right now. Let's not keep him waiting. Well, that asshole is going to help us find Rachel. You know what would be great? If I still had a gun. Yes, the chance for gunplay would just about even the odds here. So let's play this cool, okay? Just pay Frank his money, and then we can get that code for the book from him. That's all. Got it. No dicking around. Let's roll. This is the confrontation with Frank I've mentioned a couple of times. The first attempt at the conversation will always fail, but the second conversation can go right if you've done everything necessary for the best outcome in the previous episodes. To get the best possible outcome, you should search up a fully detailed guide, but the short version is keeping Chloe gun free, not pissing off Frank during this confrontation, not mentioning anything you've learned by rewinding time, and mentioning Rachel. This gets him very emotional, but it doesn't really matter if you've played your cards right, injured him or killed him, you get the code either way. After you come back to Chloe's place, you will have to play a bit of mix and match. This can be a tad bit annoying and frustrating if your deduction skills are bad, so I don't really blame you if you look up a guide for this part. Finishing the puzzle gives you a location of an old barn owned by Prescott's. You can get into the barn through the side after moving the metal sheet out of the way. In the opposite corner of the barn you can find the giant hatch hidden under some straw. After rewinding time a couple of times and using the old motor to tear off the padlock, the duo will lift open the doors to reveal a staircase, at the bottom of which is a giant security door with a keypad and a turning wheel. You can guess the password based on which numbers are most scratched off and with a bit of time rewinding. Entering the bunker will reveal a disturbing sight. There is a really expensive photo studio inside, along with food supplies that make the entire setup feel like a doom prepper got into photography. Examining the binders reveals a disturbing secret of this room. Come on, let's see what this shit is all about. We are. Okay, a binder marked Victoria, but it's empty. Look, the next one says Kate. Oh no, Kate. No. God, I should have killed that bastard back there. Kate wasn't the first. All those binders are filled with other victims. <sighs> Victoria has to be next. Nathan must be planning to dose her tonight at the Vortex Club party. Rachel. This can't be real. These are all, these are all post shots, right? Right? Chloe, look at her face. She's out of it. Maybe, maybe Nathan paid her a shitload of cash to do this. She probably would have. I don't think so. Why is he putting her in the ground like that? Where? The junkyard. Max, we have to find that spot now. Then, then we can see what he did. There's no way she's dead. No way. 
She posed for those pictures, Max. I know it. Please, let's go. Chloe, slow down. Wait for me. I know exactly where I'm going. Are you gonna help me, Max? Chloe, stop. Look. Please, no. Oh, oh that smell. Rachel. Oh. oh, Rachel, no, no, please, not her. <coughs> Chloe. I'm sorry, Chloe. I'm so sorry. I loved her so much. How can she be dead? What kind of world does this? Who does this? Chloe decides to get her revenge on Nathan. They go to the end of the world party that a few of the characters have been talking about to warn Victoria and to stop Nathan. On their way in, Warren comes up to them drunk as shit and takes a photo with Max. Inside the school at the party, uh, hold up a small break here, I've disabled the music to not get copyright striked the entire time I was laughing my ass off because this entire scene is just too goofy as fuck without the music. <laughs> Inside the pool building, you will be able to talk to a few people, like them, Brooke and Stella. Here is where becoming friends with Taylor and Courtney comes in handy, because if you are friends with both, you will have a much easier time getting into the VIP section. Victoria is here, so go and talk to her. She admits to releasing Kate's video, but will also show great remorse over the whole thing. You will get the choice between warning her and not warning her about Nathan. Depending on Max's relationship with her, she will either believe or not believe Max when she warns her. And despite having Victoria believe Max seeming like a good idea, it is actually the worst choice as you will find out in the next episode. The right thing to do is to actually have Victoria be your enemy and not befriend her at all to actually save her from what's to come. There you are. Chloe, Nathan isn't here. Nobody has seen him tonight. He's definitely not upstairs or in the lockers. Damn. Maybe he's hiding in his dorm. Then let's bail. Nathan can't hide anymore. So, you made it, Max. Oh, uh, hey, Mr. Jefferson. Um, are you both okay? You look like you're on a, a mission. Oh, uh, I was just looking for Nathan. Uh-huh. I didn't know you were pals with him. I haven't seen him since this afternoon. He, he seemed pretty upset. Okay, excuse me. I'm almost on. Let's get the hell out of here, Max. Okay, okay, everybody calm down. I don't want to get in the way of the party, but it's time to announce the winner of the Everyday Heroes Contest. The envelope, please. And the winner is... Come on! Oh my, what a shocker. Victoria Chase. Oh my god! Victoria won. Big surprise. I can't believe she blackmailed Jefferson. No. Yes, I can. Who fucking cares? Rachel is still dead, and I want Nathan's punk ass. Now. Me too. Let's go check out the dormitories. Oh Christ. Nathan just texted me. He says there won't be any evidence left after he's done. Shit. We have to go to the junkyard right now. Stop stomping around, Chloe. Right. Just get ready to use your rewind fast if Nathan tries to jump us. Oh god, Max, look. She's still there. Don't look, Chloe. Oh! No! Chloe! Look out! What the fuck?
Max wakes up in the dark room with cameras and lights pointed at her while she is duct taped to a chair. Jefferson is nowhere to be seen and escape by regular means is not possible. The only option here is to travel back in time to the moment when Max was still drugged. During certain parts of this episode, Victoria will be on the ground next to Max, however, because I didn't tell her that Nathan is coming for her, she was actually saved from being captured by Jefferson. Jefferson is a true psychopath. He's no longer the cool teacher, but an unhinged photographer with random outbursts of anger. This might seem like it was out of the blue, but I think that they were planning on doing this as far back as in the second episode. If you remember, right after you see Jefferson having an argument with Kate, you can hear him have a phone call with someone. This someone was clearly Nathan, as Jefferson will explain in a little while. After going back in time, Max listens to Jefferson having a small monologue and while he is about to give her another dose to stop her from moving so much, she kicks a trolley which spills some liquid all over a file. After Max wakes up in the present, the photos from the file are on the trolley and she uses them to go back in time again to another moment in the session. Waking up in another part of the session, Jefferson explains why he is capturing girls and taking photos of them. It's his sick obsession with capturing a trans from innocence to rage. Jefferson was mentoring and manipulating Nathan, getting money out of his family's fortune to build a bunker. Jefferson's manipulation resulted in Nathan trying to emulate his style, but he accidentally overdosed and killed Rachel. This angered Mark because he was in love with Rachel and on that evening at the party he killed Nathan, knowing full well that Max and Chloe were in the dark room already. Using time travel you can get a new option of asking Jefferson to show Max her diary. He throws it to her and Max uses the selfie she took at the very start of the game to travel back in time. Using the phone, Max warns David Madsen of what Jefferson and Nathan are doing and uses the opportunity to submit her photo into the Everyday Heroes contest. After Max has a resentment filled conversation with Jefferson, she leaves the class and you get a montage of photos. Everything seemingly plays out the same way but it seems like David Madsen had notified the police of his findings and Jefferson gets arrested along with Nathan. Rachel's body is found and Max wins the Everyday Heroes competition to Victoria's dismay. She wakes up next to Principal Wells on an airplane. Finally, everything seems to have played out exactly the way she wanted. Chloe is alive, Rachel, Kate and all the other girls are avenged, Jefferson and Nathan are locked up and Max is getting famous for her photos. Max finally arrives to the gallery and you can talk to a couple of people here. After you talk to a few people, Max goes to inspect her photo, only to get another vision of the tornado. She goes away to catch her breath, but she finds a couple of missed calls on her phone from Chloe. After she calls her back, she finds out that the tornado was just about to hit the town and that she didn't really save anyone besides Principal Wells because everyone else will get killed by the tornado in a few minutes. Go back to the photo on the wall, focus on it, and you'll go back in time again. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention here that Max destroys the photo when she goes back in time, so yeah, small addition. Max is back in the present and everything played out the same way as in the original reality. However, Jefferson found the photo in Max's diary and burned it. Just as Jefferson is about to give Max her last dose, David enters the bunker. After a small fight, David is killed by Jefferson, so you have to rewind again. Ask Jefferson for some water and while David is on the ground, kick the trolley, pull the cable on the lamp to your left, which will divert Jefferson's attention and watch David beat up Mark. After you are able to walk again, you can talk to David. He regrets what he had done and commends Max on her investigation. Hero can either tell him that Chloe is dead or that Chloe is alright. If you tell him that Chloe is dead, he will shoot Jefferson, but if you lie to him, he won't. Choose whichever seems more appealing to you. I chose the second option to spare him the pain. 
Outside the barn, Max calls up Warren and arranges a meeting with him for the photo at the Two Wells Diner. While on her way to the location, she receives a voice message from Nathan, who apologizes, confesses to his crimes and warns Max about Jefferson. But since she didn't have service, he sent it too late. In this next part, you have a couple of chances to save all of the four characters dying across the street easily. Two of them are a bit more complicated, Alyssa can be saved only when you help her out by preventing her from being harmed whenever she appears in 4 episodes, and the fisherman can be saved with a bit of time reversing and walking. You can also ignore everyone and let them die, but you're just an asshole at that point. You finally get to the two wells diner, but the front entrance is blocked, and as you approach it, it explodes. Rewind and use the box of sand in front of the diner to prevent the fire from reaching it. Also, if you've warned the homeless lady, she won't be out behind the restaurant. Inside the restaurant, you can talk to Joyce and Frank. If you side with Chloe in the argument in episode 3, you will be able to convince Joyce to let David come back. If you killed Frank in episode 4, he obviously won't be here. If he is here, you can either tell him the truth about Rachel or not, which means that he doesn't have to find out that he is indirectly responsible for Rachel's death by supplying Nathan with drugs. To progress, you have to talk to Warren. By the way, don't be weirded out, the facial animations broke during recording and reloading the save didn't help, so the facial animations for this interaction didn't work. I hate to say I'm glad to see you. I'm so glad to see you. That's okay. The important thing is that you're safe. And I know you can take care of yourself after Nathan. You should have done that a long time just ago. Just tell me you do have the photograph. I just want... Now shut up and listen. Oh yeah. You're finally going to tell me what you never did in the parking lot. I wish I would have. So I'm just going to tell you without any explanation. Trust me, okay? I always do. You should probably tell me quick. I had a vision in Jefferson's class of a tornado destroying Arcadia Bay. I went to the bathroom and saw my best friend Chloe get shot by Nathan Prescott. You with me so far? Where else could I be? Go on. Then I found out that I could rewind time. And long story short, Mark Jefferson is insane and dangerous. Whoa. Is that all? I have to go back in time. Jefferson already killed Chloe. I can't let that happen. I have to do something, Warren. What happened with Jefferson? Did, did he hurt you? He used Nathan to get drugs and money for him. Jefferson tied me up and dosed me with some drug and took sick photos of me. It was so horrible. Where is he? Busted. History which I need to change fast to make it right again. Is that bad? For every action, there's there's a reaction. Whenever you reversed or, or alter time, maybe you cause a chain reaction, even in the environment. Warren, I know this all sounds insane, but you're the only other person who I can count on now. I wish we had more time together. Do you believe me? Max, of course I believe you. You're the most amazing person I've ever met. How could there be a more important moment in history? And I'm in the middle of it with you? So thank you for trusting me. Thanks for being here. Always. When Max goes to focus on the photo, Warren will interrupt her and you can choose to either just leave, hug him or kiss him. You will get the kiss option only if you've completed all the requirements, like flirting with him, not kissing Chloe, etc. There is probably a guide on it somewhere. Yeah, I know I said some things about FUCKING GOOMERS when Max kissed Chloe, but Come on, let me have this one, the hardcore fanbase and the Coomers ship Max with Chloe anyways and I just wanna see her get with Warren. Either way, Max goes back in time to the moment when Warren took the photo. Chloe will be pissed off and I don't get why, but she doesn't believe her time traveling friend about Mark Jefferson being a killer. What the fuck is this writing? <coughs> Sorry, let's carry on. There will be a bit of dialogue shenanigans here, but it's pretty easy to convince Chloe that you are right, it's just trial and error. We got no time for this shit, come on Max. Uh, 
Chloe. Jesus, dude, what is up with you? I'm just glad we're here together. I guess you need to talk. No worries. It's all good. I'm glad you're with me too. What's going on, Max? We have to find Nathan right now. He's gonna sorry, be Warren. Connected to Rachel. Let's go now. Chloe, wait, listen. I can walk and listen, okay? Stop and listen for once. Fine, Max. I'm listening. Chloe, you can't help me. In a few minutes, I won't know any of this happened. Nothing. We absolutely have to stay in your room and do nothing. Then we explain everything to David, and we finally let him do his job. You'll have to tell me exactly what I did and said just now. Just explain that I traveled through time using the photo. Will you believe me? I'll always believe you, Chloe. So it finally seems that we have the best outcome possible. Well, except for the diner because technically oh, Frank, Joyce, oh. Warren and that other dude are all dead stuck. because we didn't prevent the so explosion. Oh well. Shut up. Oh, you're alive. You're alive. Oh, both of us. Now tell me everything that happened. You you remember, right? Well, we we left the party and made sure Jefferson couldn't find us. For once I was glad I lived in an actual fortress. Then the storm got hella crazy, and, and you said we would be safe at the lighthouse. Chloe, look! The storm is getting bigger now, and it's coming closer. Oh, I, I can't even believe this is real! This is happening because of me! Stop it! Is this, stop beating yourself up, okay? We've both paid our dues already on it. God, look at that! Look at that monster! Who knows? This could be Rachel's revenge. Our revenge. The lighthouse is out of the way of the tornado. Come on! Chloe... I've got your back, Max. Whoa! And we're back in the classroom from the start. But something is very wrong here. There are birds smashing into windows, but no one cares. Max's diary has a lot of hateful phrases scribbled into it, and her phone is full of hateful text messages from the other characters. Suddenly the bell rings and the blood from the windows, along with everyone else, disappears. If you interact with things around you, you'll find out that these objects change only when inspected closely. While attempting to leave, this happens. I see you, Max Caulfield. Don't even think about leaving here until we talk about your entry. I just wanted to know if you'd like to spend the rest of your life in my dark room. Your purity inspires me so much, and we could be so happy together. Who needs selfies when I can give you portraiture? You have to choose one There's of these no options ranting. because the game doesn't no let you leave without simping for Jefferson in some way. Leaving the classroom sends you into the dormitories where you can find crying Kate outside of her room, who will guilt trip Max over not letting her jump. If you save her, that is. Abuelo, adios, master. This entire sequence is like an infinite maze. Just use the environmental and audio cues to determine which door you need to enter next. After you leave the door for the last time, you will continue the opening sequence in the hallway, but all voices, music and people are in reverse. After you enter the toilet, you are thrown into a big maze. It's not that hard to get through it, because if any of the patrolling characters spot you, you will have to rewind a bit. There will be a quick safe spot for you here, and in this area you can optionally collect the bottles for an achievement just like you did in the second episode. Otherwise just leave the area and go sit on the bench. This transports Max into the snow globe on top of the fireplace at Price household back when William was looking for his car keys. After William's brief talk with Chloe, Max is back in the darkroom and she is in... The co the, the cook chair! After this cook chair sequence, you are in the toilets of Two Wells Diner and of course there is a fucking numpad sequence here as well. Use the mirror to find the password and get out of the toilets to meet all of the characters from all of the episodes here. They will guilt trip you plead for you to save them or be sad that they are about to die. There is another Max sitting at the table in the back, so go and talk to her. Who... who are you? Holy shit, are you serial? I'm you, dumbass. Or I'm one of many Maxes you've left behind. Can you get me out of here? Oh, so you want help? 
Thought you could control everybody and everything, huh? Twist time around your fingers? I tried to help. I only wanted to do the right thing. No, you only wanted to be popular. And once you got these amazing powers, your big plan was to trick people into thinking you'd give a rat's ass. I do care. That's why I was trying to make friends. By telling people what they want to hear? <laughs> you were just looking for a shortcut because you can't make friends on your own. That's not true. I have great friends. And I've used my powers for good. Please, stop playing innocent. You're a goddamn hypocrite. You've left a trail of death and suffering behind you. That was not my fault, you son of a bitch. Don't you dare talk about our mom that way. <laughs> what about the crap that was your fault? Wait, wait, let me guess. You fucked up time and space for your precious punk Chloe? <laughs> you think she's worth all that? We all are. This isn't about Chloe. Or even me anymore. Gosh, you're so selfless now, Mahatma Max. It's too bad you pissed your power away on high school drama. Chloe does a better job of guilt tripping me than you do. Because you let her bully you. It's called Stockholm Syndrome. But you didn't do that homework, so you'll have to learn the hard way. Like Rachel. Just shut up. You're not scaring me anymore. I'd be more worried about Chloe killing us than Jefferson. Max, do you really think she's our friend? That she respects us in any way? Man, you are so stupid. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to have the same name. And someday Chloe will destroy... Oh hell, speak of the devil. Dude, do not even fuck with her head. She knows what we went through together this week, and you don't. There's no way you can break up our team. This is reality. Afterwards, you will be going through the gallery After of the various moments Max, Max had with Chloe through the game. There's nothing significant here, but it's a nice reminder of how far we came. I have to be honest here, when I was playing this game for the first time, I didn't really pay that much attention to this part of the game. But while I was recording this part, a sudden realization hit me like a brick covered in lemon juice. This nightmare sequence feels like it is out of place, because they forgot to resolve Max's insecurities and so they decided to throw this all in the head sequence and to tie up the last loose end. Most of the side characters had their character developments done by this point except for Max whose insecurities are basically the main focus of this episode besides the story itself. So what insecurities did they want to resolve? Well, it's quite simple. This sequence deals with Max's self-hatred, her conflicting feelings about Jefferson, her self-worth issues and how she wants everyone else to like her. Besides that, the sequence serves the purpose of having you go on an emotional trip of all the events Max has been through. Both the beginning and the ending of the sequence are abrupt, but at least it fulfills its purpose. At the end of this gallery section, you can see the statue of Max being dragged by Chloe. Approach it to start the final cutscene. Max! Max, can you hear me? Please say something! Chloe? I... I must have passed out. Oh, thank God! Don't you ever do that again, okay? I swear! But that nightmare was so real! It was so horrible! My storm! I caused this! I caused all of this! I changed fate and destiny so much that I actually did alter the course of everything! And all I really created was just death and destruction! Fuck all of that, okay? You were given a power, you didn't ask for it, and you saved me! Which had to happen, all of this did! Except for what happened to Rachel. But without your power, we wouldn't have found her! Okay, so you're not the goddamn Time Master, but you're Maxine Caulfield. And you're amazing. Max. This is the only way. 
I feel like I took the shot a thousand years ago. You... You could use that photo to change everything right back to when you took that picture. All that would take is for me to... To... Fuck that. No. No way. You are my number one priority now. You are all that matters to me. I know. You proved that over and over again. Even though I don't deserve it. I'm so selfish. Not like my mom. Look what she had to give up and live through. And she did. She deserves so much more than to be killed by a storm in a fucking diner. Even my... my stepfather deserves her alive. There's so many more people in Arcadia Bay who should live. Way more than me. Don't say that. I won't trade you. You're not trading me. Maybe you've just been delaying my real destiny. Look at how many times I've almost died or actually died around you. Look at what's happened in Arcadia Bay ever since you first saved me. I know I've been selfish, but for once, I think I should accept my fate. Our fate, Chloe. Max, you finally came back to me this week, and you did nothing but show me your love and friendship. You made me smile and laugh like I haven't done in years. Wherever I end up after this, in whatever reality, all those moments between us were real, and they'll always be ours. No matter what you choose, I know you'll make the right decision. Chloe, I can't make this choice. No, Max. You're the only one who can. Now you have a choice to make. You must either sacrifice Chloe or the town. I will mention this again in a couple of minutes, but in my opinion, the more sensible option here is to save the town. Max, it's time. Chloe, I'm so, so sorry. I, I don't want to do this. I know, Max, but we have to. We have to save everybody, okay? And you'll make those fuckers pay for what they did to Rachel. Being together this week, it was the best farewell gift I could have hoped for. You're my hero, Max. Oh, Chloe, I'm gonna miss you so much. you. Now get out of here, please. Do it before I freak. And Max Caulfield, don't you forget about me. Never. It's cool, Nathan. <laughs> Don't stress. You, you're okay, bro. Just come to three. Don't be scared. You own this school. If I wanted, I could blow it up. <laughs> you're the boss. So what do you want? I hope you check the perimeter, as my step-ass would say. Now, let's talk business. I got nothing for you. Wrong. You got hella cash. You don't know who the fuck I am, or who you're messing around with! Where'd you get that? What are you doing? Come on, put that thing down! Don't ever tell me what to do! I'm so sick of people trying to control me! You are going to get in hella more trouble for this than drugs! Nobody would ever even miss your punk ass, would they? Get that gun away from me, psycho!
everyone lives but Chloe had to die. Nathan and Jefferson got busted, Kate didn't attempt suicide and Rachel was avenged. However, Max had technically never developed any of the relationships with her classmates that she developed over the course of the game. What makes this ending even sadder is that Chloe in this universe never got to reunite with Max and died bitter and alone, not knowing what eventually happened to Rachel. It doesn't matter what you do, Chloe has to die. Max's attempts at saving her were futile in every reality she left behind. Except for the second ending. If you choose to sacrifice the town, you get a much less emotionally charged cutscene. The town was destroyed and many people died. Max and Chloe lived, but most of the people they knew died, including Warren and Joyce. From the other games in the series, we know that the only people that had survived are Jefferson, Victoria, David and two other cops, since they were in the darkroom. And since there was nothing left for Max and Chloe in the town, their only option is to fulfill Rachel's last wish and leave the town for California. But wait, there is also a secret ending. Well, it's not really a separate ending, but if you've been paying enough attention to Chloe and stood by her side, you can unlock a variation of the endings where Max and Chloe kiss. Most people didn't get this on their first playthroughs, as this would require some serious simping for Chloe, Sim and no one in their right mind would do that. Well, there is a certain sort of people who would, but that's the dark corner of the internet that only Goomers reside in. Oh god. <laughs> to say that this game is flawed is like saying that water is wet or that traps aren't gay. It's just stating the obvious. Traps aren't gay. The first bad choice in gameplay design, and in my opinion, the biggest issue with this game was the final choice itself. Letting the players choose which ending they are going to get in a single choice at the end of the game is a terrible design flaw as it diminishes all of the playtime the players put into carefully considering the possible impact of their choices. It basically turns the entire game into a trolley problem with a long buildup. In my opinion, it would have been better for them to not include this decision at all but to make it dependent on your previous choices to encourage replays of this game. Another major problem with this game is how it tackles bullying and suicide with Kate's character. It shows a stereotypical storyline we've seen in other media as well, where an innocent teen girl is bullied and pushed to the brink of suicide by spoiled rich kids over a video of her own grape, and only after she attempts to take her life does everyone show remorse. It shows that bullying works and that bullies can make their victims even more miserable by exploiting their weaknesses. It doesn't try to make the point that you can overcome bullying if you stand up to it and if you have the right support structure around you because Kate never even tries to do something about it, and the only person that we see take any sort of action is Max. I get it, grape victims often feel powerless and grape overall is a very sensitive topic, but come on, this could have been handled in a very tasteful way. The game never tries to humanize Nathan up to the point where Max escapes the dark room after David saves her. All in all, Nathan's character development from a spoiled rich kid into a remorseful bad guy turned good guy could have been one of the best parts of the game. But instead of getting a proper writing for his character, we only see him getting visibly more and more unhinged and then suddenly doing a 180 turn in a voice message after Max escapes the darkroom when he was already dead. It would be nice if we had seen him actually try to warn Max and Chloe in person if we made the right decisions during the game. I gotta admit, I came into this game after a few years thinking that all of these videos that I've seen were wrong about Chloe. As I've said at the start, I will try to play a bit of a devil's advocate here but I will also give my own critique of the writing on this character. Chloe is ultra misunderstood because of bad writing. However, what most people don't take into consideration is how she became such a resentful and selfish person. She's been through years of trauma and was forced to fend for herself on every step, so of course she's going to be a selfish manipulative asshole, because it's the only way of living she knows. Many people criticize Max for not realizing that she's just being used by Chloe. This is absolutely true and it's what makes Chloe's character so misunderstood. Chloe's just using Max's abilities to find Rachel, to get money for Frank, to save her her own ass or even for her own amusement. To her Max's time reviving ability is just a toy, but no 
nobody understands why Max doesn't see this as a giant issue. If you look around the Bryce household closely, you will no doubt find out just how close Max and Chloe used to be. In my opinion, Max regrets abandoning her friend so soon after William died and not contacting her in the following years. She feels like she is guilty and responsible for how screwed up Chloe is because she just disappeared from her life at the worst time possible. Max is probably overcompensating for abandoning her best friend, which makes her ignore that Chloe is just using her abilities and doesn't care about her at all. But due to Don't Nod's writers and experience at the time, which sort of continues up to this day with the disaster of Tell Me Why But That's a Topic for another video, this point is never made. Max never realizes that Chloe is using her for her own goals up to when Max confronts the alternate Max at the end of the nightmare sequence and when Chloe finally acknowledges that she was selfish at the top of the cliff and even then Max just doesn't acknowledge this. The most important character building moment of Chloe admitting that she was using her best friend gets literally overshadowed by a fucking trolley problem where you have to choose if you're either going to save your shitty best friend or an entire town. It's like throwing a grenade and then detonating a nuke in the same spot afterwards. There's a lot I love about this game and what I dislike. Some things in it were more relatable to me than to other people, which I think is the reason why it got so much hate. This isn't a game intended for adults, it was a game tailored for teenagers. I love this game to this day because of nostalgia for those teenage days when I was playing Life is Strange. Back then I was a freshman in secondary school, I barely knew anyone and making friends was hard and back then I replayed this game so much that it was probably one of my most played games. And that's why many people dislike or outright hate this game. It just simply wasn't intended for them, but it was intended for teenagers like me who were in secondary school or in high school if you are from the burger lab. But look closely on the so-called stereotypical characters and you will find out that throughout the story these stereotypical characters change in one way or another. Victoria might be a rich spoiled bitch, but by the end she realizes just how shitty she was. Some people had said that Jefferson's psychopath plot was out of the light field and a last minute addition, but if you replay the earlier episodes you will clearly see the signs of him being a nutcase. David realizes just how shitty his PTSD and need to control made him act towards his family and by the end he proves that he cares about Chloe deeply even though a bit too late. Some people might chalk this up to woke writing but I would chalk it up to millennial writing as it's practically a game by millennials for Gen Z's. But I assure you, once Gen Z will start making story based games we will probably have new archetypes that were created in our generation such as the greasy gamer, the friendly gym bro the incel, disgusting the anime expert, the makeup divas and so on. These archetypal characters were created by millennials, therefore they feel like they are forcing their gimmicks, because back in 2015 Gen Z was just starting to create their own stereotypes of school students. And then comes the language. Sure slang words so relatable and shit, but have you ever heard teenagers talking? Not just today but back in the day as well? Yeah, they used stupid fucking words just like nowadays. The words might have changed, but not teenagers and how they interact with others. So maybe don't look at the game as we are trying to be so relatable and instead think of it as a look into the world of teenagers the way they see it. Okay, that's enough of that, let's move on to the epilogue for those two of you who are still watching. <laughs> Finally, we came to the end of this video and here I'm gonna talk about a couple of things that didn't really fit into any other part of the video and that's what I like about the game. I know that I've dissed this game quite a lot, but let me give it credit where credit is due. One thing this game does right in terms of mental health is displaying how Max experiences self-doubt issues and even self-hatred in the final nightmare sequence. At first Max has a lot of what-if questions when it comes to small things and decisions, but after some time Max 
starts being more critical towards herself and by the end of the game she outright hates herself for what she had done in that week. Chloe is there to remind us that Max is a good person and that even though she tried to save Chloe from getting shot, she couldn't have known the level of destruction and suffering that it would bring, so all of this self-hatred was really unnecessary. Another thing this game does really well is juxtaposing characters, even though it absolutely fails in this when it comes to Nathan's character. The game shows you a character being either good or evil at first, then shows you their other side and only then puts them in a situation where you have to carefully consider both their evil and good sides and gauge whether they deserve you doing something to them or not. Life is Strange really did for me what other games couldn't. It really made me use my feelings to make my decisions and predict how something might affect me in the future during the first playthrough. The decisions in most story based games are 90% the evil asshole choice or the good guardian angel choice but Life is Strange doesn't do that. It operates on this grey scale where all choices have unforeseen consequences. Unforeseen consequences. Which, yeah, is expected out of story based games. But sometimes you might think that you made the right decision when it eventually comes around to bite you in the ass, such as in the case of befriending Victoria and warning her of Nathan, which results in her getting abducted by Jefferson. Or there might be a decision that is apparently bad but turns out to be much better in the long run for you, just like in the case of stealing the charity money. I feel split on this game, but I still defend it even though it has massive flaws. Overall, this game has elements that have their good and their bad sides. The butterfly effect was designed amazingly, but failed to have any sort of real purpose with the final choice. The graphics are simplistic and beautiful, but are absolutely abysmal in the remake. The soundtrack is beautiful and captures Max's personality perfectly, but it is mostly composed of copyrighted songs, so let's plays and VODs often feel weird without them and the entire game has this beautiful atmosphere around it but sometimes tries to force it with certain cringy lines from all characters. Most importantly the single worst thing about this game is what I've already mentioned about the ending itself. The decisions in this game are so intertwined with each other that I can't even put everything in one video but the ending itself reduces everything into a trolley problem that completely disregards all of your previous progress. It's a mess, but considering that it is just Don't Not second game, it's a pretty good attempt at trying to create something original. Most story based games didn't let players go back and change their answers, but Life is Strange had the balls to let you peek just enough behind the corner to give you an idea of what is coming up next with the time rewinding mechanic, even if it was just in this game. And even though I was sucking this game's dick half the time and shitting on it the other half of the time, even with all the flaws, Life is Strange will forever hold a special place in my heart and in my personal list of my most beloved games. I played this game at a very difficult time in my life and back then it felt like this game was my only form of therapy. And yes, you can argue that I'm just nostalgic about the time of my life when I've played this game, but honestly, this game is still just as great nowadays as it was to me back when I first played it. And I wish that all the haters that this game has would see this game the same way I do. Well, what's left for me to say? Well, at least it's not an always online competitive open world RPG looter shooter with cosmetics and microtransactions and three types of battle passes with celebrities in the ads, but just a game split into five episodes that tries to tell a complete story. So yeah, that's about it. Bye.